Hello everyone, bringing you a video today talking about this, and it's an Indian wool flannel shirt. This is a topic which was requested by a commenter a little while ago, and I've been reminded of this by a Facebook conversation with someone else talking about these, so I thought it was about time I got round to making a video talking about it. Uh, this is the example of, of uh, this from my collection, I only have one, uh, but there are variations and things I'll try and talk through in the video, and it's possibly something I'll do a follow-up follow on, uh, as other people I know do have other examples in their collections. So. Uh, but to talk briefly about sort of the origins of this, um, the design seems to go back to the 1930s uh, with some variations, some not having pockets and so forth. Um, this example I have here has a collar, uh, but generally speaking they were collarless. Uh, this appears to have had the collar added. It's possible some were made with a collar, um, that is to say, obviously, the, with the actual pointed collar there. Uh, but this one seems to have had it added and it's not uncommon to find these modified bit of material lopped off the skirts uh, to make a collar. Um, and that was very, a very common modification. So lots of surviving examples show that. Um, as I say, the design goes back to the 1930s, uh, worn out in India, the Northwest frontier. Obviously, shirt sleeve order was very much the order of the day there, certainly in hotter, uh, hotter times of the year. And the existing British shirts, both the grey back and the, the newer khaki flannel shirt, were not really designed as outer garments. They don't have epaulettes, they didn't have pockets and so forth. So um, a, a shirt designed for wear as an outer garment was, was introduced essentially and made out in India uh, and that had epaulettes. Some early examples I think didn't have pockets, uh, but that's beyond the scope of this video really talking about early examples. This is a mid-war to late war example of uh, the Indian uh, flannel shirt, made in quite a dark greenish khaki colour. Um, in this particular uh, case they were made in a variety of different colours. Um, uh, Indian manufacturing I think of, you know, sort of drab wool flannel was acceptable. Uh, and you see them from almost a grey colour to a brown to this and uh, lots of different shades in between. Um, original parts of the design, uh, two pockets at the front here, with scalloped flaps, not particularly, uh, there's no practicality to that but it looks nice, uh, but having pockets is a practical addition to the design of obviously British issue uh, collarless shirts didn't have uh, pockets at all so that's a nice addition to the design there. Half fronted down the front, as you can see, fairly standard for military shirts of the time. Only two buttons, there is no button at the collar. Originally, when it was collarless, there would have been, but this has had, as I say, I believe this has had the collar added, and I have actually added a hook and eye so it can be closed at the collar. Um, obviously not damaging the shirt in doing that, but it means I can wear it closed with a tie underneath battle dress, should I wish to. At the shoulders here, you do have epaulettes as well, as I say, something miss missing off the British flannel shirt designs of the time because this is really designed to be worn, as I say, as an outer garment. Um, otherwise, very simple design. Um, you can see here, very simple cuffs with a single button there, but they do open nice and wide, so they're easy to roll up. And um, we'll have a look at the detail of the pockets, the closure at the front, the epaulettes and the cuffs. Now, you can see details of the pockets of the uniform and the front closure. And as you can see, the buttonholes are hand-stitched. The buttons in this instance are made of horn, but you could equally see the coconut shell buttons, which were used on a lot of Indian made clothing, and metal buttons as well. Here you can see detail of the epaulette, and as you can also see here, there's actually a red line running down just inside the front of the shirt here, and this is actually at the edge of the cloth, so someone has worked right up to the edge of the cloth in manufacturing this shirt. And you can see detail of the cuff here, as you can see a very simple round cuff, but with a wide opening above the single button, uh, which means they can be easily rolled. As I say, I believe this has had a collar fitted, and generally speaking, these were collarless, and the collars were often fitted, obviously with material removed from the skirts, as I've already mentioned, and that appears to have happened here. The skirts are somewhat shorter than you would expect, and also the stitching along the bottom edge here, where they've been hemmed, uh, is different to the stitching on the rest of the shirt, uh, as is the stitching used to attach the collar, so that's been modified at some point, and it's a very common modification to see. Many surviving examples of the shirts uh, have this modification. I'll turn this round now and we can have a look at the back. Looking at the back here, you can see we don't have any vertical seams there, in fact, on the sides. We'll have a look at that in just a moment. Uh, but you do have the one seam over the shoulders here where the front of the shirt joins the back. Um, so quite a simple uh, construction of this shirt, uh, as is to be expected. Looking at the side of the shirt here, if I just lift up the arm, you can see the seam in the arm here and running down the side. And then obviously you've got the opening there at the bottom where the skirts would be. And obviously the skirts, as I say, have been truncated to provide cloth to manufacture the collar on the shirt here. So a question that may arise looking at this is why did the British issue wool clothing out in the Far East? Obviously, cotton clothing was in production as well and the trousers were made of cotton. Why was the wool shirt issued? Now, 
prior to sort of the Second World War, medical thinking and so forth favoured wool uh, in tropical environments. Indeed, it was seen to give a thicker layer of protection from the sun over the skin. And indeed, some examples, uh, certainly private purchase examples, can be seen with a, a spinal piece. And some issue clothing also came with a spinal piece to protect the spine from the rays of the sun. This was medical thinking at the time. But wool was also recognised uh, as uh, being a good material because it maintains a fair, relatively steady body temperature. When you're very hot and you sweat, you sweat into it. Wool, as we would now describe, is self-wicking. It takes the sweat away from the body, the sweat evaporates and it cools you. At night, even when damp, wool will, you know, when it's cooler, wool will still keep you warm. It would act as an insulating layer in that scenario. So wool, uh, as a natural fibre, as natural fibres go, is a really good fibre for wear in such situations. Indeed, it, it, it has good properties across a wide temperature range. And it would still be worn, wool would still be worn in the Far East by the British Army into the 1960s. You still see wool shirts being worn there as well. One other aspect of this, and you'll have seen me wearing the shirt uh, from Chindit reenacting, they were very commonly worn by the Chindits. Um, the wool shirt is harder wearing than the Airtex um, bush uniform, the bush shirt uh, and so forth, uh, and the battle dress blouse as well, um, because it's simply a thicker cloth uh, and it would, it's basically got better wearing properties than the Airtex, which is very thin, can snag and can tear. So from the point of view of long distance operations as the Chindits were involved in, in both of their operations, the wool shirt serves very, very well in that capacity because it's harder wearing. Uh, and it won't wear out as quickly. Obviously, you're not going to be resupplied with uniform or you're unlikely to be uh, in any great quantity. Some uniform items were dropped uh, dropped in to replace worn out boots and things like this, but it reduces the need for that because this will wear longer. So that's the advantages of the wool um, in a uh, tropical environment. Or for the time, uh, it made sense. Obviously, man-made fibres and things were a little bit more advanced in that regard, didn't exist, uh, and wool was a good choice for the time uh, in many respects. Um, but obviously issued alongside cotton, Airtex clothing and so forth. So that is the Indian wool flannel shirt. Um, I think that's everything I wanted to cover in this video. I'll do my usual little spiel at the end here just to say obviously if you like my videos and you'd like to uh, see more of them then please do consider subscribing if you haven't already and make sure you have the little bell, little notification button down below which will alert you when I upload future videos. Uh, there's also the Facebook and the Instagram page where obviously I post photographs of the collection and so forth. Uh, it's a good place to keep up with things that are going on as well. If you really like my uploads and you'd like to support the channel, there's both a PayPal link and Patreon down below. Uh, very kind, those people who've uh, supported me through Patreon on an ongoing basis and made one-time donations through PayPal. It's exceptionally generous of you and thank you very much. As ever, it's greatly appreciated. And there's also an email address should you wish to get in contact with me, share photographs, things like that. There is an email address for the channel down below in the, comment, in the uh, video description as well. Uh, but that's everything I wanted to cover, as I say. So until next time, bye for now.